Morning. Thank you all for coming to this event titled Beyond Nuclear Diplomacy, A Regime Insider's Look at North Korea. We would like to thank our partners for this event, the National Endowment for Democracy and the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. We are very fortunate to have a rare guest speaker with us today, Mr. Young ho who will give a keynote address. But before the speakers are introduced, I would like to say a few words about safety at CSIS. We feel secure in our building, but we have a duty to prepare for an eventuality. My name is Lisa Collins. I am a fellow in the Korea Chair, and I will be your safety responsibility officer for this event. Please follow my instructions should the need arise. If something should happen, please use the staircases to exit the building, and once outside, please make your way to the National Geographic building um, behind CSIS. Once there, I will give you further instructions. Please follow my lead. Uh, one note about the note cards that you received when you checked in. Those are for questions. Please write your questions down. We will be collecting those um, uh, in about 10 minutes, so please pass them to the end of the row where you're sitting. I would like to first introduce our three speakers who will give some brief remarks before Mr. Tay takes the stage for his speech. First speaker is Dr. Victor Cha. He is the senior advisor and inaugural holder of the Korea Chair at CSIS. He is also director of Asian Studies and holds the DS Song KF Chair in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. From 2004 to 2007, he served as director of Asian Affairs at the White House on the National Security Council. Our next speaker is Mr. Carl Gershman. He is the president of the National Endowment for Democracy. During his tenure at NED, he has overseen the creation of the Journal of Democracy, the International Forum for Democratic Studies, and the establishment of the Democratic Fellows Program and the Center for International Media Assistance. Prior to joining NED, he served in the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, where he was senior counselor to the U.S. representative to the U.N. He also previously was a resident scholar at Freedom House. Uh, Mr. Gershman has dedicated his career to fostering and promoting uh, and strengthening democratic institutions around the world. Uh, lastly, we will have Ms. Roberta Cohen, who is the co-chair emeritus for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea as a speaker. She was formerly a senior fellow in foreign policy studies at the Brookings Institution and co-founded the Brookings Project on Internal Displacement. She also previously served as a senior advisor to the representative to the United Nations Secretary General on internally displaced persons. She is a human rights and displaced persons specialist with a long and distinguished career in the field. Having worked in the State Department and on the U.S. delegation to the U.N. Commission on Human Rights earlier in her career. So we will have the speakers speak in the order that I have just mentioned them. Um, and Ms. Roberta Cohen will introduce uh, Mr. Taeyong Ho. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa, and um, uh, welcome all of you here to CSIS today for this very special event. Um, uh, this is a, a very appropriate time to be having today's discussion, uh, given all that is taking place uh, on North Korea uh, and the activities that are now taking place in terms of um, the reauthorization of the North Korean Human Rights Act. So. Uh, we're very delighted to have uh, Minister Taeyong Ho with us today. Uh, and on behalf of my colleague, Shannon Green, uh, the Human Rights Program, as well as um, the National Endowment for Democracy and uh, North, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, we're very happy to have you here. I also want to recognize uh, Ambassador Robert King. Where is Bob? Ambassador Bob King, um, who has also joined us today. As you know, he was. Uh, uh, President Obama's uh, special envoy on human rights abuses in North Korea um, uh, for both terms, for two terms. So um, with that, let me turn it over to Carl. Well, good morning. <clears throat> I'm delighted that the uh, National Endowment for Democracy is co-sponsoring this important meeting with the Center for Strategic International Studies and the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Under Victor Cha's leadership, CSIS has organized some of the most important discussions in this city about North Korea. And just last week, HRNK published a very significant report by David Hawke about the prison camp system in North Korea, providing new information based on satellite imagery. It's great to be here with my 
Also great to be here with my friend and fellow HRNK board member, Roberta Cohen, and I also want to take this opportunity to recognize Lynn Lee, who manages NED's extensive North Korea grants program and who is, was instrumental in facilitating <coughs> Tae Young Ho's first visit to the United States. This visit is very timely since the United States is struggling not only with the question of how to deal with uh, the security question of how to deal with North Korea, which presents uh, this nuclear threat, but also with the question of how to understand North Korea, which may be less urgent, but is ultimately a more important question. Young Ho can help us answer the question of how to understand North Korea, which is a precondition for the development of an effective policy to deal with the security threat. There have now been some 30,000 defectors who have been able to escape from North Korea. All of them bring their own experience and insights, but none has a more intimate understanding than Young Ho of the North Korean elite from which he comes. And none whom I have talked to has done more thinking about how to communicate with the North Korean people whose complete isolation from the outside world is only now beginning to break down. No solution to the North Korea problem will be possible, in my view, without ending the isolation and of the North Korean people and bringing both elite North Koreans and the mainstream population into communication with their neighbors in South Korea and with the international community more generally. To the extent that Tae Young Ho can help us do this, he will be contributing to our own security and to peace on the Korean Peninsula and in the world. It is in that spirit that I welcome Tae Young Ho this morning and await his remarks with the greatest interest. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK, uh, it's not every day that we have the opportunity to hear from a senior North Korean diplomat who declared his break uh, with the pervasive 70-year dictatorship in his country. Allow me to make three points before introducing uh, Mr. Tae Young Ho. Uh, first, as Carl has mentioned, more than 31,000 North Koreans have managed to escape from the DPRK despite the tremendous risks involved in getting out of the country without permission. Whether it's crossing the Tumen River at night or arranging a diplomatic defection, the individual and his or her family could be caught, sent to a prison camp, and the relatives and colleagues left behind punished. Since its founding in 2001, uh, HRNK has worked with numerous North Koreans from a variety of backgrounds who have fled and has produced more than 30 documented reports on the human rights situation. These have encompassed the traumatic plight of those who escaped and how North Korea maintains surveillance over those who try to help their country persons thereafter. We have been following Tae Young Ho's public appearances and statements with great interest. Second, the importance of increasing the flow of a broad range of information into the country cannot be overemphasized. As Mr. Tay has publicly pointed out, desperately needed change in North Korea will require a change in thinking. Education and information will expand that thinking. No reign of terror can imprison thoughts. One of the people in the world I have the highest respect for was former Soviet dissident scientist Andrei Sakharov, who was a member of the Soviet elite. He saw the importance of bringing freedom of information to a closed society and asked for copies in Russian of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenants on Human Rights, agreements his government has ratified and which he wanted known and upheld. 
Sometimes it's argued that overlooking human rights concerns tamps down tensions. But accepting the practices of violating governments only delays the reckoning. Finally, uh, today's international preoccupation with the dangers of North Korea's nuclear weapons program should not be allowed to make us forget the human rights situation in the country or the need to speak out for those abused, especially in political prison camps, which rank among history's worst. It's not just nuclear weapons that need to be addressed, but an entire system of political repression, which is at the base of the most dangerous policies. Let me now introduce Mr. Taeyang Ho, the highest ranking government official to defect from North Korea since 1997. We all welcome his first visit to Washington. Mr. Tay joined the foreign ministry in 1988 after receiving degrees in international politics and English from Pyongyang and Beijing universities. His specialization in the diplomatic service was Western Europe, having served in the European Department of the Foreign Ministry and in posts abroad in Denmark and Sweden and in London, where he was Minister and Deputy Chief of Mission from 2013 to 2016. Much earlier in 2001, uh, in an area close to the work of HRNK, um, Mr. Tay headed North Korea's delegation to human rights talks with the European Union. Many have heard uh, Mr. Tay on the air, uh, but it's a special treat to meet him in person. Uh, he is now an advisory research fellow at the Institute for National Security Strategy in Seoul, Republic of Korea. This week in Washington, in addition to the program here, he will be addressing the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we are going to most assuredly learn a lot from listening to him today. May I welcome you to the platform, Mr. Tay. Oh, thank you very much for wonderful remarks about me, and thank you very much for Dr. Cha to uh, give me this wonderful opportunity to present in front of many prominent uh, experts uh, today. Uh, actually, I prepared around three hours of long lecture about North Korea, and I didn't expect that uh, CSIS gave me only one hour, and, and I was told that one hour should be divided into two sessions. One is 30 minutes of presentation and another 20 minutes of Q&A, so that's why I'm thinking how can I present all my talking points which I wrote already. So originally I uh, decided to, uh, what I planned is that uh, I want to uh, tell uh, me, uh, four points. The first one is the reason of Kim Jong-un's obsession with ICBM tipped with nuclear warhead. And the secondly, what I uh, planned is to uh, justification of Pyongyang policy for elite uh, internal brainwashing education. I think that could be very helpful. Um, uh, thirdly, then what is Kim Jong-un's next step? And fourthly, then how best to deal with Kim Jong-un regime. But since there is a limit of the time, I would rather focus uh, the first uh, uh, points why Kim Jong-un is so much obsessed uh, with the nuclear and ICBM and what really happened inside North Korea before Kim Jong-un decided to uh, go nuclear and ICBM, and what uh, about his personal you see, characters and aspects? That is what I want to tell from my personal experience uh, this morning. And before I'm going on, my, uh, the talking points, the purpose of my visit, and uh, the main focus of my visit in America during my stay is uh, 
uh, and will be a three points. Uh, whenever I meet, wherever I go, I continue to tell American public that North Korea is not the subject for destruction, but it should be the subject for change. That is what I want to go tell. And secondly, everyone agrees with permanent peace on Korean Peninsula. So since our goal is peace, then the means to achieve that goal should be peaceful, peacefully. That is the second point which I want to deliver. And thirdly, I support maximum pressure policy. But I strongly believe that maximum pressure should go together with maximum engagement. And maximum engagement, I think, should include not only the Kim Jong-un leadership, but also North Korean population as well. I fully agree with Mr. Karl Kirschman's remarks about we should end the isolation of 24 million of North Korean population. And how can we end that isolation of North Korean population? So that is the main the points of my visit of U.S. And the first of all, I would like to go on the first uh, the part of my uh, talking, the reason of Kim Jong-un's obsession with ICBM tipped with nuclear warhead. So the main focus of uh, this point is I want to tell all those unfavorable environment for Kim Jong-un's early transitional period, which made him pursue nuclear and ICBM strategy. The first I want to tell about the political challenges he faced uh, at his first uh, years. And in this political element, I want to tell about the lack of legitimacy to lead a North Korea for the next several decades. Of course, there are many elements that you know, you are all very well read. That's why that the succession process by Kim Jong-un was uh, down to top. Kim Jong-il spent, Jong spent more than 10 years uh, to be officially appointed as the leader of North Korea by Kim Il-sung. But Kim Jong-un's case was different. It was top-down succession process. So why this kind of top-down succession process influenced very much his way of thinking of nuclear and ICBM? Uh, when Kim Jong-un uh, first became the leader of North Korea in 2012. At his early stages, he thought that the absolute authority of the power as the new leader of North Korea will naturally delegate to him. But what he experienced at his first few years, especially the first years, was not the case. Even though he was the official leader, of North Korea when he discuss or meet, meet his, those senior leaders. First, he learned that the body languages of the senior leaders were quite different from those body languages those leaders took towards his father and towards him. Because before Kim Jong-un publicly appeared, Kim Jong-un just uh, was nothing but the third son of Kim Jong-il. That's why when all that kind of image changed, the atmosphere of treating Kim Jong-un was a little bit relaxed, gentle, and soft. But now after five years of his power, now you can see there is a significant change of body languages of North Korean senior leaders, how they treat, for instance, when even in front of thousands of audience, like the party plenary meeting when Kim Jong-un asked some of his, you know, the leaders to come and tell something, somebody would come and you can see they almost uh, knelt down in front of Kim Jong-un and uh, speak something. So that kind of body language, uh, we, I, we haven't seen that kind of body language 
in almost uh, several decades in North Korea. That kind of border language was only seen in Lee Dynasty. Yeah. Right. And uh, secondly, he learned that even though he, is, he was the leader of North Korea, but he learned that he did not have that kind of strong legitimacy. He learned that whenever he watched the senior leaders' attitudes around him, he thought that there was a little bit, you know, looking down upon uh, by those senior leaders because he's the third son of Kim Jong-il. And ironically, in North Korea, normal, uh, the population of North Korea don't know that he's the third son of Kim Jong-il. Nobody know, uh, no, you know, normal people know that uh, the Kim Jong-nam is the first son and Kim Jong-un's mother, Ko Hyung-hee, is just one of those many ladies uh, uh, Kim Jong-un left together. So uh, if you read uh, North Korea's medias or whatever in the past five years, Kim Jong-un continued to uh, delegate that he is the only uh, one in main bloodline of uh, Baekdu, Baekdu Hyultong. But after five years in power, he even now did not tell North Korean public that the date of his birth, nobody knows, even I, even I don't know when he's born. And the second thing is that about his mother, and thirdly, and most importantly, he could not show the photo of his young years with the President Kim Jong Kim Il Sung. He didn't have that photo with his grandfather. He was just a hidden boy in Switzerland. So all these things uh, gave him a kind of a very strong mistrust not only on senior leaders, but even on his family members. So I call it unnecessary mistrust on his family members and senior leaders. So for instance, in February of 2012, Kim Jong-un made a film about his mother. If you go today to YouTube and type it in, in Korean it's Songun Joseon-e Omoni, but in English it's the mother of Songun Korea. And you can see the whole film. But that film is forbidden in North Korea. And I still don't understand how that film was released in YouTube. Kim Jong-un, in February of 2012, showed this film to very limited number of senior leaders in North Korea. But when they watched this film, they told Kim Jong-un that this film should not be released. Why? That is about his mother. But everyone didn't agree that Kim Jong-un may release that film because if that film is released in North Korea, it may create great confusion in the society because until the end of 1980s, the official wife of Kim Jong-il, the Kim Jong-suk, acted to some level as the official wife of uh, Kim Jong-il. So for instance, in New Year's, uh, the Kim Jong-suk, you know, presented the flower to Kim Jong-suk, the mother of Kim Jong-il, as an official wife of Kim Jong-il. He visited in North Korean uh, the culture. Every New Year's Day, the wife should uh, give official, you know, the New Year greetings to family members, senior family members. So at that time, Kim Jong-suk did that together with her daughters. So some people inside the family and in senior leadership know that Kim jong Su is the official wife of Kim Jong-il. So if this new film is released, then there could be a great confusion. So that's why the film is stopped. But what happened in March of 12, 2020, uh, 2000, 2012 was that all of a sudden there was an unhidden purge inside North Korea because many people actually saw that film secretly. So 
we had a kind of general party meeting to confess whether we have seen this film or not. And if anyone uh, uh, was uh, detected by uh, circulating this film among uh, his friends or family members, just all of a sudden became the subject of prosecution. Yes, so even now, uh, I don't know where, when Kim Jong-un would uh, release his, the name of his mother and whatever, but I'm not quite sure whether he can do it in the near future or not. So that kind of, uh, those dilemmas of his, for instance, uh, the background of education, because Kim Jong-un is the North Korean boy, but he didn't have any friends in North Korea because he spent all his time in Switzerland. He didn't have any university uh, friends or middle school friends, kindergarten friends, nobody. Uh, he's just a boy dropped from the sky, I may say. Another political challenge is he learned is that disintegration process of North Korea in his early transitional period. Uh, everyone is very well know about the impact of South Korean cultural contents, and he learned that whenever he convened the meeting, like today, if there is a kind of meeting like this in North Korean society, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the audience would sleep. So he learned that there is no enthusiasm, even in elite group, in policy discussions or whatever. So he decided, you know, that the, the former the Minister of Defense, Kim Yong chul was prosecuted because of he closed his eyes during the meeting. So he learned that there is no uh, enthusiasm in the senior leadership on the future of North Korea. No energetic involvement of discussion. Whenever he put up the topics for discussions, the people do not open their minds easily or no enthusiasm. Second, economic challenges. Many people kept asking me why Kim Jong-un took the policy of nuclear or ICBM instead of economic reform, like what happened in Vietnam or China. That could be a good opportunity for Kim Jong-un to legitimize his leadership if he introduced economic reform. But was it possible at that time? The I, in this regard, uh, everyone knows that uh, the uh, capitalist element in North Korea is expanding and getting flourishing. But is this the right choice for Kim Jong-un to adapt or he should avert this current direction? And today I want to tell something about the failure of currency denomination, which happened in 2009. Uh, the questionable issue is Kim Jong-un's involvement in currency reform uh, according to the sequence of time in 2009, I think which is very important uh, to me. Uh, as I have told you that nobody, even in foreign ministry, uh, knew about the existence of Kim Jong-un. But in January of 2009, all of a sudden, we were instructed to sing a song. The, the name of that song is a uh, song of footsteps. And all of a sudden, we were uh, told to use, at that time, Comrade General's remarks. Comrade General, Dejang Dongji. But at that time, even in 2009, there was no name of Kim Jong-un, just Comrade General. So that happened in January. And uh, we were heard that a lot of party instructions and, uh, came down from the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea with the name of Dejang Dongji, Comrade General. So I strongly believe that from the January of 2009, Kim Jong-un was involved in every process of important decision making. In November 2000, all of a sudden, North Korean uh, regime announced currency reform. And you know that the currency reform failed. 
within one month. And Bang Nam Gi, who was the architecture of this current reform, was prosecuted. So why? Why this current reform failed? It is unprecedented. It is the first time in North Korean history that the party officially acknowledged the failure of their policy. So what happened? It's very interesting. On the first day of the first current reform, all, everyone in North Korea was instructed and was informed that only 5,000 of new notes can be exchanged, 5,000 of notes. But what is the reality at that time? You know, in North Korea, there is no any uh, banking system, uh, I mean, capitalist banking system. So that's why the family assets are accumulated in currency notes, not in banking accounts. So the people, most of the people at that time accumulated millions of currency notes, but all of a sudden, everyone was instructed to change only 5,000 notes. So it brought a huge protest, dissatisfaction, and complain. So after three, three days later, the amount of exchange increased from 5,000 to 50,000. But what happened after one week? The shops, the free market were all frozen. Nobody at that time in North Korea wanted to sell because nobody was sure how the price would rise up. And nobody was sure whether this current reform would succeed. So all the things are kept in the warehouse, not on sale. So after two weeks of this current reform, the whole North Korean society was frozen. And Bang Nam Gi was prosecuted in one month, and the current reform failed within one month. So the lessons Kim Jong-un learned from this current reform is there could be no immediate solution through economic reform, or it can be too much risky if he goes on economic reform. The second thing he learned that it could be very dangerous to the society and the system if he threatens the right of the economic survival of normal population. So that's why even now, you know, the numbers of a free market in North Korea is increasing, and Kim Jong-un uh, so far hasn't taken any decisive measures to stop this process. To some extent, he even uh, allowed uh, the current process of uh, marketization. So that failure of reform gave, left him very strong influence in deciding the ICBMs. And at last, I may say, uh, no, thirdly, about the military uh, the aspects. You know, when Kim Jong-un came to power in 2012, he toured all the military units among DMZ. He toured every unit, all. But the what he learned is the lack of preparedness for a possible war and high spirit, corruption, obsolete conventional weapons. So there should be something for him to control huge conventional forces, not only for the war, not only just for the war, but to prevent any possibility of military coup. You know, North Korea, there are 1.2 million conventional forces. If these 1.2 conventional forces are idling every day without any immediate purpose, of military action, how can you control this huge military force? He should have something to control. He should have something to insert the energy for continuation. So he should have something. And I will tell about fourth reason, the international factor about the arrival of Arab Spring. In, we have to uh, focus something on international environment during this process. NATO bombing on Libya and so-called 
justification of humanitarian intervention. Now the world politics is changed. In the past, uh, any military action against a sovereign state was regarded as aggression. If you read the Charter of UN uh, United Nations, then it is clearly said that no military action could be justified against a sovereign state. But now things are changed. Now we have to focus on the new international term of humanitarian intervention. So any government or any leader in current world is engaged in massacring a certain group of people of the society because of the difference of polit political reasons or ethnic, religious, or whatever, if there is any kind of mass killing, then he could be the subject of humanitarian intervention. And this kind of military action now is justified, what we, can, we have seen in Libya case, when Gaddafi you know, tried to uh, stamp out those anti-government forces and demonstrations, then NATO bombed and neutralized Gaddafi forces. So next day, Gaddafi was caught and killed on his way to defection. So this kind of international factor uh, gave a very strong influence on Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il. So for instance, if that kind of even a small scale of uprising or people's, you know, the protest happens in North Korea, there is no doubt that Kim Jong-un would stamp it out mercilessly with his forces, even tanks or whatever. He can do anything. But the question is, when the world learned this kind of open crackdown in the streets or whatever, then United States and the world and South Korean government should take a certain action. And if Kim Jong-un believes that he is equipped with ICBM, tipped with nuclear, then he can prevent that kind of humanitarian intervention. How long I can go? How many left? Yes. Somebody, Lin, I will appreciate if you signal me when I uh, arrive at 30 minutes, OK? Yes, so to have q &A. And the last but important, what I say is that sudden and premature death of Kim Jong-il. So you know that Kim Jong-il fainted out all of a sudden in August of uh, 2008. At that time, what happened in foreign ministry is that we st every day we report through documents to Kim Jong-il. There was no any uh, they sign on those important documents on the police lines. So we waited. We waited one week. What happened? You know, there was no. And at that time, the whole North Korean society was frozen for three months before Kim Jong Il reappeared. And Kim Jong Un didn't expect that his father could die in a very that short of span of time. So there was no any proper education for Kim Jong-il for his son's leadership. So the conclusion he reached is he needs to prove his ability for his leadership of North Korea. So in March of 2013, the policy of simultaneously developing nuclear economy was adopted. They call it Pyongjin policy. And I want to tell one important fact in this regard. Uh, ironically, at that time in March of 2013, foreign ministry, I mean the foreign policy line of North Korea was excluded from this process of adopting very important policy. Nobody in foreign ministry, maybe foreign minister, I don't think even foreign minister knew about this kind of underneath process of adopting Pyongjin policy. So Pyongjin policy actually arrived all of a sudden to North Korea without any notice. All of a sudden, one day, 
I opened up the university, I read the newspaper that yesterday North Korean Workers Party convened an important meeting and there was a sudden declaration of Pyongyang policy. Yeah, it's finished, almost, all right, last thing. At last, I think this is important. Uh, in that meeting, uh, first Kim Jong-un read uh, around 20 minutes of uh, so-called his report. He just read some, uh, all these reports, but when he finished reading, he said very important words to the audiences of that meet, plenary meeting. What he said is that forthcoming war, forthcoming war will not be the war between DPRK and USA, but it will be the war of idea and will among ourselves. So at that time, nobody really understood what that means. He said, the future will not be the war with America, but we, the, we, it will be the war of wills among ourselves. And after the March of 2013, the purges, persecutions started in North Korea. In August of 2013, you know, the first purge of Unhasu Orchestra Band happened. Eight very famous number one musicians of North Korea were killed because of Rizalju's element. You know, Rizalju was just a normal and a singer in UNAS orchestra, and all of a sudden she became the first lady of North Korea. So there were a lot of rumors inside that UNAS orchestra, and in order to consolidate his power, the first, I mean, the collective purge happened in UNAS orchestra. The second one is Chang Sok Tek's case in December of 2013. In North Korean history, of course, in the past there were, North Korean history was full of persecutions, purges, whatever. But in our history, there was not something like the total purge of one department of Central Committee of Workers Party of Korea. The total Chang Sok Tech's department, more than 300 people working in department were all even the families sent to camps. And 11 members of that department, vice directors and section chiefs of 11 people of that department were prosecuted. It is really unprecedented in North Korean history. So I would rather stop at this point in order to open a free Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tay, for those insightful and interesting remarks. We will now transition to our Q&A session. If you'll just take a seat on the stage, Mr. Tay. Oh, thank um, you. And I'll introduce our moderator. Um, Ms. Shannon Green is director and senior fellow of the Human Rights Initiative at CSIS. Prior to joining CSIS, she was senior director for global engagement on the National Security Council staff. She also previously worked at the Center for Excellence on Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance at USAID. She has extensive experience working in US government, academia, and the nonprofit non sector on issues of human rights, civil society strengthening, and international development. Um, so we'll go ahead with our Q&A now. Great, thank you. And it's my honor to moderate this portion of the program. We have lots of questions from the audience and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. So I actually want to pick up where you left off, which is drawing this connection between Kim Jong-un's obsession with the nuclear program and becoming a nuclear power and government repression. Can you help us understand how his obsession has resulted in a deterioration of the human rights situation and sort of what is the status of human rights in North Korea today? Oh, uh, as I have told you, those are uh, the persecutions uh, and purges in the, five, in the past five years is even uh, so unprecedented in uh, North Korean uh, the, the standards and uh, one of the uh, differences of 
human rights violation which happened in the past and in the past five years is that uh, now the world, for instance, now is able to collect the actual, you know, the evidence of all these, uh, the, the human rights population, uh, the persecutions, for instance, no, I think Kim Jong Nam's case could be very good because now the world uh, has seen how uh, Kim Jong Nam uh, was assassinated in, in, in international airport, and in the last, the past few years, for instance, the important figures who were persecuted now the world have those photos, the video files. And for instance, what I said about UNASU, you know, the purge of UNASU orchestra now, the world has all those video files of their performances, even in YouTube. So now the world has accumulated, even now, all those very good evidence to prove that Kim Jong-un is the head of this whole uh, the persecution. That's why I think it's the time for the world to to do some action. That is my position. That's a great pivot, actually, because we have a lot of questions about solutions and how can external actors help promote change in North Korea. So one of the questions that we have is about what are the best ways of ensuring that a diverse array of outside information and sources are able to penetrate North Korea? And whether you have some ideas about what are some of the new tools or mechanisms for getting that information into the country. Yeah, what I want to discuss uh, today is that uh, these days, because of uh, the sixth nuclear test and ICBM, uh, the uh, the general uh, possible approach on North Korea now are swifting from soft power to hard power these days. Uh, but I'm uh, strongly uh, believing in the use of uh, soft power before taking any military actions. And is there any possibility and whether we can have more effective way for any kind of uh, disseminating outside information inside North Korea. North Korean system uh, can only be in place by reign of terror and the strong prevention of out, in, inflow of outside information. But you know, we can't change the uh, policy of reign of terror of Kim Jong-un regime, but we can do the dissemination of uh, in, outside information inside North Korea. For instance, now, because of the recent econo the IT uh, development, those devices which North Korean population uh, can reach are also uh, developed if the size of notels now us this big the usb is now even uh, changed into small sd cards and in north korea this kind of small sd cards for the smartphones are called among the young boys we call it nose card why we call it nose card if somebody wants to search your body whether you have any usbs or whatever the boys instantly take it out and then put it in your nose. <laughs> yes, so they call it nose because we ask, they, in, in Korean terms, we call it kokumon card, that is nose card. Then we said, yeah, do you have any nose cards? That means, do you have any uh, uh, internet game installed in that a small uh, SD card or any film or any English textbook or whatever? So the technology. Uh, developed uh, dramatically in the past five years. And another thing is that uh, what I want to tell is that uh, I, uh, the German reunification uh, cannot, that cannot achieve that easily without the East Germans watching uh, the West Germans TV for several decades. But nowadays actually the world and even South Korean America has all those technologies and the means to let North Koreans watch South Korean TVs and even Americans. For instance, if Google, I'm not sure whether it could be Google or not, but if any the country or any satellite system expand, expand their uh, wave of uh, transmitting across North Korea, and if we uh, uh, smuggle in the this size of a uh, small size of uh, almost uh, uh, 
the similar size of smartphone of they call it a DNB whatever to receive the satellite uh, the signal then if uh, that kind of a small uh, Davis can even able North Koreans to watch outside TVs secretly inside their houses. In the past, of course, the people used uh, radios, but now because of the development of technology, now made it possible for North Koreans to have uh, access to information. I believe you're meeting with members of Congress while you're here in Washington, D.C. And as you know, Congress is considering the reauthorization of the North Korea Human Rights Act. What are you going to tell them in terms of what you would like to see in the renewal of that act? Oh, oh in this regard, oh, in the past five years, the world uh, has done a lot of things by raising this human rights uh, uh, issues, for instance, uh, I would like to appreciate a lot of contributions made by uh, Robert King on this regard, uh, uh, and also the Michael Kirby's report. I was surprised to read the uh, Michael Kirby's report because it was the first uh, the uh, report uh, written by international uh, the experts on North Korea, and oh, we have to see the changes even uh, from the North Korean side on these human rights cases. For instance, in the past, North Korea refused to respond to UPR system, but because of this successive campaign, now North Korea decided to respond on UPR. Of course, they do not accept all those recommendations, but important change is the be beginning of the response to UPR uh, the system. And in the past, in those uh, the human rights uh, UN meetings, uh, North Korea delegation will only consist of very junior levels. But these days, uh, for instance, in uh, 2016 and 15, the former North Korean foreign minister, Ri Su Yong, even foreign minister, attended that human rights uh, the conference in Geneva. So that's why the human rights case is now even regarded as a kind of very important issues uh, even by North Korean regime. And I want to tell very uh, uh, one significant development is that now in North Korean embassy worldwide, if there are any North Korean workers of that country, then there is a one diplomat in each, in each embassy who should be in charge of uh, reporting the working and life conditions of North Korean workers there. And if uh, there is no, if there is a delay of payment to North Korean workers, or if there is a lack of working conditions, then uh, the diplomat who is in charge of uh, overseas uh, the workers should take action. So, for instance, if you uh, see those video files of North Korean workers in Russia or in China or in Middle East in the past, they, when they work outside, they even do not carry the safety helmet. But these days, everyone is forced. Because in North Korea, people, we are not used to carry that safety helmet. But nowadays, every workers are forced to take on that uh, safety helmet because the embassy always asks the, the North Korean workers to carry that helmet in case if some journalists or reporters took pictures working without that helmet, then it could be uh, uh, the subject of criticism mm. by the world. So in order to uh, protect and also in order to justify the policy of sending North Korean workers to abroad from North Korean side, they have to take this kind of actions or policies in order to cope with the criticisms on human rights issues. Yeah. So we have to continue this process. So we have another question from the audience about the value of technical and scientific engagement, and whether those kinds of activities are a good thing to do to find these peaceful means of communication and to keep these channels open, 
or whether it's just a wasted effort and wasted money and serves to legitimize the regime. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Oh, oh it is a, a common knowledge that now North Korean population watch South Korean movies and dramas, but uh, those cultural contents made by uh, South Korean, uh, the cultural industry, uh, were produced for South Korean audience, not for North Korean population. So that's why so far those cultural contents only served for the entertainment of North Korean population. They, these contents do not uh, connect the North Koreans of uh, the actual uh, daily life with uh, the future of all these things. So that's why I think now it's time we should make a tailor-made content for North Korean uh, the populations to watch. For instance, in North Korea, for in, uh, I want to tell a very interesting story. In North Korea, uh, if a girl is physically beautiful, then naturally uh, when you reach at the age of 14, you are registered by uh, uh, the party and people's committee of that region. And if that girl's physical beauty continues to the age of 16 or 17, then uh, the girl would be uh, sent by the authority to Pyongyang to either work in a special guest house or in special hospitals for senior leaders. Uh, that kind of thing was common in Lee Dynasty. But what is the general concept of normal people? For instance, in a, uh, the countryside village, if the girl uh, was sent by the authority to the capital for that kind of purpose, then North Korean, the normal North Korean population accepted as a kind of honor. They do not think that this is a human rights violation or it, the sexual abuse or sexual exploitation, no. They regard, they accept it as a kind of honor of the family to be sent from countryside to the capital. So we should make that kind of, you know, the cultural content, uh, that is a really stupid, the culture and thinking, right? And, and the, for instance, in North Korea, there is no any uh, concept of payment for the labor you sacrificed, you know? So for our North Korean society, uh, 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 was going on by mobilizing huge populations for constructions or whatever, so they don't have this kind of sense of the, uh, the payment. So that's why if we should educate North Korean people that they should be paid for what they sacrificed. So we should start from these basic concepts of cultural contents, not like, oh, Kim Jong-un is dictator or North Korea is damned communist society, whatever. We should start from basic concepts of human rights and freedom. That is my belief, yes. Great, so we have one final question, and this one is of a more personal nature. Um, and the question is about the experience of North Korean defectors and trying to understand what is life like for you now in South Korea? And also, what is the role or responsibility of defectors in dealing with the human rights challenges and abuses in North Korea? Mm. <laughs> it's, a, a, it's a very broad yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. Uh, why I uh, strongly believe in uh, dissemination of outside information or uh, the educating North Korean population because my belief is based on my personal uh, experience. Uh, as you know, I spent uh, more than uh, 20 years you know, abroad in my uh, past uh, 55 uh, years of my lifetime. Uh, so my uh, the life was a combination of uh, frequent travel and posting between Pyongyang, Stockholm, Denmark, United Kingdom, or China. But uh, uh, through these, uh, uh, the, the process of uh, traveling and different posting, uh, actually, of course, I know 
knew the contradictions of all these things, but I uh, always uh, at the dilemma uh, whether I should continue to pretend my double life of uh, inside North Korean system because I uh, enjoyed a certain level of uh, privileges, economic benefits, you know, as one of member of elite in North Korean society. But when I saw the growth of my children in UK, because uh, I was fortunate to have my sons uh, in London, and when my sons arrived in London, they saw quite a different world. They started internet, internet games, Facebooks, emails, you know, of all these, you know, something uh, uh, they faced different world. And I saw the happiness you see, of all these things. And uh, when they more involved in UK system, uh, we have a very uh, severe family discussions about North Korean system between me and my sons. And my son said, oh, internet is so great, even for study, for fun, for everything. But why North Korean regime does not allow internet? Because as a young boy, they think internet is very good. Then I have to answer my uh, son's questions. And what I told to them that if North Korean regime is open internet, then what could be the result? Because people may read all the stories about Kim family. Yes, then that, if everyone knows about the story of Kim family, do the people continue to support that leader and that system? I don't think so. So that's why North Korea will not allow internet system. It will not allow forever. You see, then my son said, oh, what do you mean? No more internet forever? You know, no internet? So, um, so all these uh, very basic questions always put me in a very difficult situations, and I have to convince my sons, you know, of, uh, and at last I decided as a father, uh, I thought that as a father, the, the biggest legacy which I can uh, leave for my sons is the freedom. Uh, I cannot uh, push my sons back to North Korean society and I learned, of course, if I insist, they, will, they would go together with me, but uh, I, it is absolutely sure that it could be a great sacrifice uh, and also they would not be happy in their life uh, because uh, there was uh, opportunity for them to live in free world, but it is me who see, cut off that opportunity. So uh, I decided that the best uh, the gift which I may give to my son is the freedom, uh, which is so common to everyone here. So I strongly believe that if we educate North Korean population, then we can change North Korea. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, before we get up and go, I want to ask everybody to just stay seated for a minute while we escort our guests out here. I hope you all agree that this has been a really insightful conversation, and we really appreciate Mr. Tae Young Ho's candor in talking with us today. So please join me in giving him a round of applause. Thank you. I would like to uh, the present my thanks in Korea.